welcome. This is another um, series panel, SBI Summer Series panel. I think it's about our seventh um, panel this summer. And today we're gonna be talking about interviewing for Breast Fellowship um, and how COVID might change that process. Um, my name is Mitha Patel. I'm a breast imaging radiologist at OSU and I am the Breast Imaging Fellowship Director. I'm really excited today. We've got a great panel today. We've got some fellows, some people who just finished their fellowship. And um, we also have um, uh, Dr. Miller is a and me. <laughs> program director. So let's go around and maybe introduce if you guys could introduce yourself. Um, we want to start with uh, Dr. Miller. Sure. Why not? I'm, I'm Dr. Matt Miller. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm kind of a veteran at these things now, but uh, I am the Associate Residency Program Director at the Allegheny Health Network in Pittsburgh, PA. Um, I am also involved in the fellowship um, selection uh, at, at, at our program, and uh, I'm excited to be here today talking about this. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, Dr. Cubison? I'm Alyssa Cubison, a brand new graduate from fellowship at Northwestern Prentice Women's Hospital in Chicago. I also did my residency in Chicago at Loyola, just down the street. Um, and then I'll be starting as an attending uh, at Ohio State very soon. Thanks. Um, Dr. Conyers? I'm Jesse Conyers. Um, I'm a brand new breast imaging fellow at Emory in Atlanta. Um, I just graduated a residency from UT Southwestern in Dallas. Great. And Dr. Wofter? Yeah, hi, I'm Megan Wofter. Um, I just finished my breast imaging fellowship at UT Southwestern in Dallas. Um, I did my residency also in Texas at the Baylor Scott and White program. Um, and I'm about to start at a Rad Partners uh, private practice in Houston. Great, okay, welcome. Um, okay, so today, like I said, we're gonna be talking about breast imaging fellowship, um, the interview process. So I think there's always a lot of questions about just in general, the interview process, what to look for. Um, but today we're going to also be talking about how it could be different this year. So um, I believe probably all programs are going to be doing virtual interviews, whether they're Zoom or um, FaceTime or Web WebEx. Um, just to give you a, a little bit, uh, some background in terms of the calendar and the dates, August 1st is when programs can accept applications and SBI has a universal application um, that you can get off of their web page that most programs use. And then new for this year is the start date for interviews, virtual interviews, is November 1st. Um, in the past, we used to only interview after January 1st, so it's moved up a little bit. And then um, April of 2021, the ranking opens. May of 21, ranking closes. And June of 2021 is the match day. So, um, that's what the the calendar is going to be like. So let's first first talk about um, how how should applicants decide what programs to apply to? What should they? What resources can we use in order to figure out what programs we should be applying to, or they should be applying to? You want me to? Start? I can I can start. I, I try, I, but, try to ladies before gentlemen. Uh, <laughs> But I, I can I can jump in just because I've been I, I'm easy to, I'm I'm I got a big voice, um, but uh, so the number one thing that people should be looking at when they first decide that they want to do a breast fellowship um, is they can get on the SBI website and there's a database so SBI the SBI website SBI slash online dot org, I believe. Um, if you just type in Society of Breast Imaging in Google, you'll find it. it's the first hit. Um, but it is our, you know, um, organization's website that under resources, there is a plethora of resources for potential and future fellows. And the first thing that you should look at is what programs have fellowships. So not every program that has a residency program has a fellowship. But you know, a lot of them do. Um, you know, you could probably guess the, the the big names or whatnot will have fellowships, but you know, there are fellowships, you know, littered throughout the country. So the first thing you need to do is get a list of programs. That's what I did when I first, you know, decided got serious about fellowships is I actually printed off the database and saw all the programs that are out there. And then, you know, 
you kind of do the same thing that you've been doing since you know residency there's geography there's different things and and you know you can whittle it down that way and then once you whittle it down based off of like filters like geography and size and stuff like that then you start to get into the nitty-gritty of what makes fellowships different and unique so I th i'd say the first step would be actually identifying what programs are out there yeah, I think that's really important too, um, because the SBI website will tell you who's participating in the match this year, and it's been updated for this year. So that's a really good resource. Yeah, and most programs do participate in the match. I think maybe like 90% um, do, but there's there are a handful that don't. Um, and I, I'm not sure that that information is on the SBI website. Yeah, they only, they only have the, so in order to get on that database, you have to participate in the match. So everything on the, on that database is, every program on that database is with the match. Now, yeah, I mean, I when I was applying, there was only a couple programs that were outside the match and they were kind of non-traditional breast programs. Um, so, you know, I didn't apply to any that, that actually did not go through the match, but I do know that there are some out there. So I, I think one big question too, when we're when you're looking at all these programs, is um, because it's a virtual interview and you might have more time and you might be spending less money in terms of traveling. Do you do you apply to as a candidate? Would you apply to more programs than you maybe I would, would before? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it makes sense that most people will. I think ultimately is probably going to be a good thing in some ways because when you're limited by your budget your travel budget your time budget you can only take so many days off of work maybe you overlook some programs that ultimately would be a really great match for you um, and now you have the opportunity to virtually meet with those programs meet the people make those connections and I think that's really going to be a great thing for people do you think that you should maybe um make a list of the programs you definitely want to apply to and then pick just a few. There is obviously this worry that everyone is going to apply to all the programs. You know, the, right. the fellowship programs are going to interview everybody and um, there's going to be this application fever. I think that everybody's a little bit concerned about that, which may not end up happening. But um, is that is that the so so I'll say this, I'll say this, you know, I, I tell my residents um, to approach. So first things first, breast imaging fellowships aren't that competitive. I mean, they're competitive. They're competitive from the standpoint of, you know, uh, the big names or, or whatnot. You know, you, you should apply to more than one. Absolutely. But if you want to do a breast imaging fellowship, you're going to do a breast imaging fellowship. Um, so that's the first thing. It's, it's not like you're applying to a neurosurgery residency or a dermatology residency. You know, they're, they're, you, know you don't have to apply to 20 fellowships um, in order to get a fellowship that you want. That being said, I always tell my residents to have a comfort level in that you don't want to over apply in that you'll waste your time and you'll waste the other people's time. Um, because time is valuable. I mean, it's, it's not, not just coming from someone who interviews coming from, you know, someone who's gone through interviews, you know, you don't want to go to an interview, even if it's virtual, sit there and talk to a bunch of people for a bunch of hours and you have no interest whatsoever in even, you know, ranking this program. So, you know, I would say a sweet spot of, of, you know, three to six programs. I mean, I, I, you'd be hard pressed to not get a program in your, you know, your top five, to be honest with you, um, in, in, at least in my opinion. Um, but, you know, that's, I, that, that's, that's the advice I would give um, residents, you know, you can apply it. It is, it is easier. It definitely is easier because now that it's going to be virtual. Um, but again, it's still, it's still a time thing. And if you have no desire to go to a place, there's no sense in applying to that place. So, yeah, you know. I would only apply to programs where you're seriously thinking about going. Like if it's in a state that you think you would want to live in or an, an area that you can see yourself living for a year. Um, but I agree with your number. I think I interviewed at like six programs and that seemed like plenty. Um, maybe a little bit more this year might be reasonable, but I don't think you need to go crazy. And when I applied, there were more spots available than people applying. I think that's still true, but um, kind of like Matt said, 
you know, there's a good chance you're going to match. So I don't think you need to have a lot of anxiety about whether or not you'll match. And I think the emphasis too, if you really are interested in a program that I think, you know, potentially programs know that there may be this greater influx of applicants because there's less barriers than there previously were. So if you are interested in, you know, X number of programs, I think it's even more important you let that program know why you're interested in that program, um, be it geography or, you know, the research facilities or what have you, but because I think it's kind of known that there's going to be more applicants and, and you want to know that you are serious about that program. It's not just a convenience interview that, well, I have an afternoon free and yeah, you know. absolutely. Yeah. Just for reference, um, I believe in 2020, the, um, there was only maybe 5% of applicants that didn't match in breast imaging. And I'm not sure whether they maybe match in another subspecialty um, but you know, there was maybe like 30, 30% 30 of the spots were open or something like that. So it's, you can find that data on the NRMP website, but it's definitely favored, um, for the applicants. So, uh, um, yeah, but so think about those statistics. So 5% didn't match, but 30% programs had unfilled slot slots. So, I mean, yeah. there's, there's an opening there, you know, even if you didn't match, you can go to one of those programs. Sure. So 30% are, were still open. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So, you know, I know that Matt talked a little bit about um, geography. Um, what do you guys think of large versus small programs, pros and cons? Um, should you mix it up when you apply? I, I mean, of course, there's pros to both for sure. Mm -hmm. I happen to have been fellowship trained in a larger program. There were six of us. So I'm obviously biased because I, I got definite educational value from that. I liked that there were five other fellows to, I mean, I learned as much from the fellows oftentimes as anything else, just because sometimes if, you know, there's that question that you maybe just don't want to ask your attending that, you know, you just, and I think if you can ask the other fellows how they may approach something, there's great educational value to that. And then, you know, morale too, it was wonderful to have five other uh, radiologists and friends at your disposal. Of course, there's great things to, having one or two fellows in a program, definite educational value to that. But just as in my experience of large, I, um, I really like that. How yeah, about, I think also, yeah, go ahead. Also, yeah. I was just gonna say in a large program, you're obviously having a huge, a larger volume of patients, which is why they need more patient, more fellows. So um, I think it gives an opportunity to see like a greater diversity of patients, most likely to be in a bigger hospital setting. Um, and potentially too, like, it depends on where you did residency. And maybe if you went to a smaller program for residency, you want to go to a big program for fellowship, or vice versa. Because obviously in a small program, if it's just you, you're the only fellow, then all of the staff is going to be, you know, just focusing on you and your education. Um, and that might be a benefit to, to people as well. Definitely. So I can speak, I went to a small fellowship program. I, I stayed, so I did my uh, residency training at West Virginia University. And um, they had two and a half, uh, two and a half breast imagers there. Um, and one breast fellow. And I, so I felt comfortable with the breast imagers there. I, I already had developed a relationship with them. I knew that they were fantastic breast imagers. Um, and I wanted to spend a year, you know, just intensifying my learning from them and just basically being their apprentice. And so I got to know the, the two main breast imagers extremely, extremely well. Um, it, 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 you know, I was geared up to actually stay there, um, stay at WVU, but then life kind of happens and, and we decided to, to make a change in our, in our plans. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the plan was for me to get trained by these two, two and a half breast imagers who were fantastic. And, you know, I came out of there, I, I always say that, that I did kind of too many fellowships. So I did six months where there were two main breast imagers down at, at, at WVU. And then February of my fellowship year, we actually had a third breast imager who, it's funny, we kind of traded places. He was actually at Allegheny Health Network. He, you know, ran Allegheny Health Network's breast imaging for, you know, 20 years, 15, 20 years, and then decided he needed a change and just wanted to kind of do a, a locums thing or kind of an ad lib thing. And so he came down to WVU and started at the second half. So I say pre-poll or post-poll fellowship. And, 
<laughs> so I got kind of two. Tell him you understand what you're saying. Yeah. Do you know Dr. Pollard? Yeah. Do you do? Okay. So, yeah. So it's it's uh you know I I did a pre Pollard fellowship and a post Pollard fellowship, and you know you could never plan. I didn't plan that when I decided to do this fellowship, but it was so beneficial to me, kind of having that intimate relationship, um with with these three breast imagers and knowing the ins and outs of how they do things and you know you know the two the two girls that are down there you know dr shahan and dr lane um were fantastic from their standpoint but then just to get a different flavor from a guy who's been doing it forever from dr Pollard and actually trained dr lane um it was you know invaluable to my training and you know i'll say this you know we're, we're all here and we're all going to be talking about our experiences and and where we are and you know you know, Mitva, you have a fellowship. I have a fellowship. You know, we think that our fellowships are great, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think that there's, you know, you know, we have one fellow. You guys, you take a couple fellows, right, at Ohio State? Or you take one. Okay, so you yeah. still have, you have a small fellowship as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can go to a place like Northwestern with, with six. Um, you can go UPMC takes, I think, three. Um, you know, there, there are different sizes, just like residency programs, but you can, you can become a great breast imager at a big program. You can become a great breast imager at a small program. It's, it's all on comfort level. And really, you know, where the, the style that you're used to learning that, you know, I, I think you just need to be honest with yourself. And, and some of it is fit, which is, you know, I, I might be skipping ahead a little bit, but this is something that I really want to talk about because um, you know, a lot of times it's that visit that really can tell you whether you are in the right environment for your learning, whether you fit in that area and losing some of those informal interactions, which um, really sort of tell people whether this is the right program or not, not necessarily this, you know, formal interview. How, how do you guys suggest applicants determine, you know, the, um, the culture and the fit of a program in a virtual interview setting? Nobody knows. <laughs> <Does anybody> know? <laughs> well, it's tough. Well, I always tell people for residency interviews anyways, um, talk to as many people from that program as you can. And I think that applies to fellowship as well. So um, even in a virtual setting, there's a lot of opportunity to reach out to people, um, even if that's outside of your actual virtual interview experience. Um, but I, I know the fellows you know, in my program and in other programs would be happy if you sent an email and had questions or kind of wanted to get a feel for the program. And I think the fellows be very honest with you about, um, you know, kind of the culture of their program. It, you know, it's, it's a tough question. And it's a question that I'm not only trying to answer for fellowship, but I'm also trying to answer as, as an associate program director of my residency program. It's like, you know, how can we take this suboptimal situation and make it, as optimal as possible and and like you said but no one really knows um you know it's it's tough it's it's tough both ways it's tough from our standpoint to get an appreciation for you know interviewing you yeah you can answer questions and that's great and you know have a good appearance and whatnot that's but you do lose some of that personal interaction yeah. um I, I i think i think uh talking to people that have been there is a big thing I think going off of reputation, off of that, um, getting on message boards, you know, message boards can be a cesspool sometimes though. Um, but, but at the same time, you know, you can, if you can wade through kind of the, 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 the cesspool is the, the BS, if you can wade through that. Um, sometimes you can get good information talking to former residents. If you have, you know, breast imaging is a small community. We've already made connections ourselves the last couple of weeks on these things, connections we didn't even know, you know, and, and so people know each other in the breast imaging community. So if you talk to someone, a breast imager at your, you know, your native program and you say, Hey, I'm really looking at program X, there's a good chance they say, well, I don't know anybody there, but you know, I think, I think, uh, Johnny Ray or, or Peggy Sue may have went there and they may know someone. So maybe I can connect you with them and see what they think. And so if you just kind of open up the communication lines and talk to people, there's a good chance you're going to know somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody there. <laughs> don't be shy. Reach out, like you said, Madge, Absolutely. right? You know, even if you don't know, if you, even if you don't know them, whether it's on social media or email, um, people are willing to talk about their programs. And one thing also I wanted to mention is 
Um, if you're interviewing for fellowships, I think you can look at what the residency um, is also putting out. I think that there's going to be some tours and videos, um, probably, oh, of residency programs. And so you might get an idea um, of what the the you know the setting looks like. I'm I'm not sure, especially for small programs like mine, whether we have the budget to make a big video production, you know, um, of of what our fellowship is like. I think we'll try to post some things, but I, I know that residencies will have more of a budget and certainly larger um, breast fellowships will. So you can get I just, some I just filmed one last week <laughs> for the residency. Oh you did <laughs> yeah. 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 We'll have to watch yours. <laughs> yeah. oh, I, I would also just add that I think even though it's like a weird setting that I think there's a lot that people can glean from these Zoom meetings and like personality wise when you interview with somebody just looking for those connections and then really like when I did all of my interviews, residency, fellowship, whatever, um, I kept a like a little notebook and basically as soon as the interview was over, I just wrote down my gut feeling, just how did I connect with people? Like, what did I overall think of the program, the personalities, all that kind of stuff that is sort of intangible. And you forget as you do like several interviews and then, you know, you have something to go back to that's, you know, you immediately did right after you talked to those people. So that's, I think we could still get a lot from that. that that's a really good point um, because especially with the time span, you know, I mean, if we're talking about interviewing in November mm -hmm. and you're making your match list, you know, in the spring, the months later, writing down those just gut feelings of, you know, did I get a good feel um, from this interview? I think that's a really good, really good point because you'll, you know, it's, sometimes it's easy to forget. Maybe not your number one or you're at the bottom, but somewhere in the middle right. when you're in your rank list, you know, trying to decide, I think it, that might be, that might be important. That's a really good point. Um, okay, so um, when you, how about what should you look for um, in a program? So do you think um, in terms of types of procedures and studies done, how do you, how do you find that out and what's important? I thought it was helpful for me going through the process of trying to assess volume. Um, I mean, of course, I, I'm sure that being having pros and cons to most fellowships in different ways. And I'm sure, you know, there's adequate volume, but I did feel like uh, most places I go, there would be some sort of, you know, oh, our volume is really high. That was just kind of what I heard generically. And of course, but I think when you kind of ask more specifically, well, what may, you know, how many diagnostics may you read in a day or how is the workflow? How, what's the screening? Um, you know, how many screeners do you read and, and what's that expectation? I think that was really helpful to get some concrete numbers so you can better assess what the volume is for that. Um, and then, you know, just kind of, you know, potentially the MR volume too, because that's kind of plus minus with each program. Um, so I think that was really helpful to like try to concretely assess um, specific numbers. And those are fair questions to ask. Don't be shy to ask those questions. Those, every program should be able to spout out what a typical day of a breast fellow is and what, what the volume you're expected to read is. Um, and, you know, cause it does vary. I mean, that, and, and in my personal opinion, you want to go someplace where you're going to, it's going to be voluminous. You're going to be, you know, not tossed to the wolves, but to the sense that, you know, you're going to feel that pressure to, to kind of keep your volume up and, and read stuff because you want to get exposed to as many stuff as you can. We, I think, you know, uh, Dr. Chan in previous lectures talked about how important it is just to learn how to read a screening mammogram. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you don't want to go to a place where it's just, okay, yeah, we do a bunch of diags a day and you might read, you know, five screening mammograms a day. No, you want to, you want to be, you, you want your screeners to, you want to read like 40, 40 screeners a day and, you know, get through those and um, be able to, you know, ask your attending questions and, and learn how, you know, to read a screening mammogram, because that's the bread and butter of what we do as breast imagers. Yeah, I mean, procedures are going to be there. MRIs are, you know, that's that's another big thing and, and whatnot. And, and uh, you know, localizations, that's another thing you need to talk about. Um, but realistically, I mean, the, the screener volume, I think, is, is, is important. Yeah, and what may be high to someone is, you know, high to someone else. So, you know, it may be overwhelming for one radiologist. But sure. Oh, absolutely. So I think it's, you know, that point it's good to ask specifics 
Yeah, I think screeners are really important. And I found that that was actually a gap in some programs that I wouldn't expect, you know, just kind of asking more questions about how many screeners do you read? Because it's really important to do during your training and just kind of ask like, how do the fellows, you know, get exposed to screening mammograms? And I think that's a really important question to ask. What about other types of studies? Do you think, um, you know, it's important to go to a place that does um, supplemental screening or which ones do you think, what do you think is important in terms of looking for additional studies? So that, that's, a, that's a tough question as far as, uh, I mean, MRI, you know, any uh, MQSA certified breast center, they're going to do bread and butter stuff. They're going to do screening. Everyone's doing Tomo now. You're not, you know, that, you know, three, five years ago, that was a big thing. Make sure that, you know, you go to a place that does a lot of Tomo. Now, you know, most, if not all places, you're, the majority of what you're going to read is with Tomo. Um, so there's that, there's the MRIs. Um, you know, when you start to get into maybe a bus versus, um, you know, if they do the, the contrast enhanced ultrasound or, or, or uh, gamma imaging, um, you know, all that stuff is great. That, that stuff is, is fantastic to learn. Um, I'm not sure unless you have a specific job in mind where they're telling you to, that you need to have experience in this. I'm not sure how important that is to, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's more or less one of those things kind of icing on the cake. Oh, and you know, and I'm, I'm going to get, um, you know, I'm going to get really good at reading ABUS. You know, I, I just happened to, to learn how to read ABUS at WVU because we had a, a, a decent volume of it, but there are other places that don't. And, you know, I don't, you know, it was nice for me to, at my current job, you know, the ABUS wasn't as evolved as it was down at WVU. And so we were just starting to start it up. And so it was nice that I was one of those people that say, oh yeah, I got experience in that in fellowship. So I was able to read it, but did I plan that? I didn't actually plan that. I'd like to say I did, but I didn't. Um, you know, so if you have an idea of the job that you're looking at, so kind of working backwards a little bit, but you know, if you do have that idea, then that's beneficial and you're able to look for that. Yeah, I would add on to that, that um, this isn't like a special study or anything, but I think, um, like for ultrasound, for instance, um, in fellowship, I scanned every patient that I did my own ultrasounds. Um, and I found that to be really important in residency. We had techs, amazing techs that did it. And I put my hand on ultrasound probe in residency probably twice, <laughs> but in fellowship every single day, multiple times a day, I was scanning patients. Um, and that kind of hands-on training, I think knowing how to work the machine, knowing how to get the images and all that kind of stuff is, is, was really important to me. And I think really helped my understanding of breast imaging and made me a better imager. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think that there's, I think as you guys said, there's, there's pros and cons. Um, you know, it's nice to be able to go to a new job and say, I can read all of these specialized studies, you know, like, you know, I can read abbreviated protocol MR, I can read contrast MAMO because there is a learning curve. But on the other hand, um, you know, I've learned some of these studies like ABUS and contrast MAMO after I've been out. So just That's letting, you know, people know that it's going to happen. You know, you're going to learn a new modality in breast imaging, and that's part of what makes breast At imaging. At some point, better. your training is going to become obsolete. It happens to everybody. <laughs> it will. It will. And so you're <laughs> going to have to learn it. And I know that seems scary. So there is. It's nice to go to a program where you learn some of those, so that you can, you know, be the new new person on the job and just say, yeah, I know how to do all of this, no problem. But if you choose a program that doesn't have, you know, all of these specialized studies, it's okay because that's sort of that's life in breast imaging, I think. So, um, so I guess I sort of answered my question. <laughs> Either way, no, but I agree. I, I think I, you know it's good. It's if you can find a program, you know, I I wouldn't say, you know, if if you're comfortable at Program X and you really like the staff at Program X, you really like what it has to offer, but Program X doesn't have, you know, what fast MRI. That's not, yeah. that's not a reason to say, oh, no, I can't go there. They don't have fast MRI. Yeah. You know, it would be nice if they did. It'd be nice if, you know, they were, you know, pushing that envelope a little bit, doing that. But I'm sure, you know, there are other things. There are other hidden values at each program that, you know. And it's two years out. So, you know, that's something to think of too, right? You know, um, if they don't have it now, there could be something that they start to have. They, you know, if you choose a program just because there's a one person there that's a known person, you know, 
they they could leave in two oh, years. Absolutely, it happens all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Just do it on that, right? It should be it should be a little bit more than that. So, um, yeah, Dr. Kanye, sorry, where did did you were you gonna say? No, I, no. I, think, I think there are some deal breakers, but those kind of things are not, you know, you're going to pick them up if you need to, when you need to, um, but you need to become a good breast imager and you need to go to a place where you feel comfortable. Yeah, absolutely. It's about that fit, right? Um, what about um, a play? What about moonlighting and call? Um, what are, what's, what's out there? What have you guys seen? You guys have interviewed probably at different places. I think it's pretty variable. I don't think you should make your decision based on either of these factors, to be honest, because they can, are both subject to, to change. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Like call, yeah. if you're in a bigger program, you know, the call can be spread out among more fellows. So that's nice. Um, some programs don't take any call. Some take some calls, some take paid call. It's, it's really variable, but in general, I think breast fellowship doesn't have a lot of call. So I think you're safe kind of in general. I know. Yeah. So and I'll just add to that. Okay. No, I'm so sorry. I, I was just gonna say it was helpful. I know. I, for I was... <laughs> <laughs> okay, Alyssa, go. No, I do have some friends that you know they knew they were pursuing private practice. That was just something they wanted for their career. So the moonlighting, you know, with potentially other imaging modalities, that was important to them to keep their skills up in that year that they may have got lost. So that was more of a factor, um, you know, maybe in people who wanted to pursue academics, maybe less so. So that can be a consideration, but a grade, maybe not a deal breaker. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, yeah, I totally agree with that. And I, sorry, I was just gonna say that, um, like personally, I had a, a friend who, her fellowship had no call um, when she interviewed, and then when she got there, there was call. So that can totally happen too, where you think, oh, I'm taking this program because they have no call, and then two years later, they do. <laughs> Done, yeah, it goes, goes back to the point, like, don't just make it based on one decision, right? You know, you have to sort of yeah. look at the, the whole um, package. Um, you know, I, I think maybe it was Dr. Cobbison, you, you mentioned a little bit about um, going a whole year of just doing breast and then maybe entering private practice. Is that something that people worry about? Um, you know, are there a lot of programs that just do 100% breast with no um, service day or call? Or do I most think, of them have? Hmm? Oh, um, I, you know, I, just at my fellowship, it was one where it was just breast. Um, potentially you could have pursued maybe an elective month or, or a couple of weeks, depending upon what your career plans were. I think there was some flexibility, but in general, our curriculum was 100% breast. And then I know at least half of my class did go into private practice. So um, they opted to pursue a little more moonlighting just because of course that they didn't want to go a whole year without reading any CTs or anything else that they didn't have to. Um, but I can't speak to all programs. And I, and I feel like at most of the ones I interviewed, some type of mo moonlighting in a general call pool was a possibility at least. So, so I do think that this, uh, that this might fall under a category. I mean, there's, there's some varying degrees of, of, of gray here, but th this might fall under the category of being a benefit of going to a smaller program and that you can sometimes cater your fellowship to what you want to do with it. So I know that at WVU, um, I was able to take a lot of chess call that I got paid for that was moonlighting. And um, just so happens that the job that I took after fellowship, that's the type of call that I take. I take chess call. So it was, it was a really nice transition. Um, you know, here at Allegheny Health Network, you know, the, the, the one fellow that, I, that I've worked with since I've been here, um, you know, we, she wanted to do some body. So she was able to take some body call and got paid for it. Um, I don't know, you know, um, if, if someone were to go to a larger program, it'd be tough to make those changes because you'd have to make those changes for everybody sometimes. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's, there's areas of gray there. I'm sure that a lot of large programs will try to, you know, get you what you need. Um, but at the same time, it's a little bit easier when you go to a smaller program. Hey, I'm your only fellow. Can I do this while I'm doing breast as well? Um, and so I, I think that that's a benefit of a smaller program. That's a good point. Um, speaking of payment, um, 
do most programs talk about um, some of the, um, you know, leave, pay? How do you how do you approach some of those potentially more delicate subjects in a Zoom type interview? Do you feel like um, do most programs just have like a, a presentation in the beginning where they let you know some of those things, or is it something that people normally have to bring up? And would you bring it up in a Zoom interview at the end, or would you reach out afterwards? I think generally it's something that you can kind of look up on the website and see. Usually there's a standardized pay. Um, they will offer it, they will tell you if you're going to make more than that, but they they're usually don't offer up that information in my experience. It's like kind of something that I can just find on the website, um, but I don't know about you guys. Um, and so I'll, I'll answer this kind of twice. So from a, a, a residency standpoint, we have a PowerPoint that we give that we give all those statistics just right out. This is what residents get paid here. This is how much vacation you get. This is, you know, this is how much, you know, sick time you get. This is the moonlighting opportunities. We have a, a whole PowerPoint that's dedicated to that. For fellowship, um, I haven't, we haven't really discussed how we're going to approach that. I know that when people talk to me, those questions, I, I hope that people get that from me, that I'm a pretty open guy. Those questions are fair game. I'm never going to ding someone for asking me, hey, can, you know, how's, how's the, how's the living environment there? How, you know, I got, I got a family, I got, I got four kids, you know, how, how am I going to make a living here? Um, I, I think that those are all, you know, people teach you in medical school, never ask about money, never ask about, but, you know, you breast, your, your job is one facet of your life. And yeah, you want to be really good at that facet of your life but you also have to have a personal life as well and in order to do that we have to you have to know okay what's the living environment going to be like how am I going to be able to make a living am I going to be able to live in in downtown New York City or downtown uh, Los Angeles or downtown Pittsburgh or suburban Pittsburgh or whatnot you know what what is how's it going to be how can I sell this to my family that hey I really like this fellowship this is how we're going to live for that one year I think those are all fair game questions, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, what about research opportunities? What what should people be looking for um, in terms of research in a program, or you know, if they're interested in that? I think if that's you know how you again kind of see your career going. So if that you know that that is potentially something you want to pursue after fellowship, then. It's always helpful to have some kind of idea of where you want your long-term career to go because tailoring your fellowship to that is, is as best you, as much as you can know is really helpful. So I think some people know that they definitely want research to be incorporated. And then of course, in that case, it should be a factor. Um, and then, you know, I always sort of felt like asking things about, you know, potentially is their own statistician, something like that. Um, I say that only because it's just kind of an idea gives it a reflection of maybe how much research is actually done in the department or how much, if, is there, if there's a need for one at all, um, or if, you know, there's uh, any of the attendings pursue it or, you know, what kind of culture it is there. Um, and then I think just asking around just like anything else and then looking up your own PubMed searches in that. Um, but if it's, you know, not something you definitely know you want to be a part of your career, you know, kind of plus minus what factor it is for you. Did you find a lot of programs require when you guys were interviewing? I don't, required research or strongly recommended research during your fellowship? Yeah, I think there was some type of research slash scholarly activity that was a requirement, um, you know, kind of loose requirement there, but for the most part. Yeah, I think good questions to ask would be, you know, what kind of time do fellows get to do research? Is there any protected time for that? Um, and is there a research expectation or is that kind of something that's more elective? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, which brings me to questions. What, um, what kind of questions, because you should be prepared to ask questions, what kind of questions should you ask? Um, you know, when you're interviewing Everybody will say at the very end, do you have any questions for me? <laughs> so be prepared for that. <laughs> and um, what, what are some good questions to ask? I always thought, and I think it was brought up earlier, but it was huge for me, the independent ultrasound scanning. 
-hmm. That was a really big uh, thing that it may not come up in the PowerPoint presentation in the beginning, probably wouldn't. Um, so, and I think most programs may, you know, probably will have, um, or at least a lot of them will have dedicated ultrasound breast uh, technologists who are fantastic and will give you those great pictures uh, and it'll make you feel like it's so easy, but it's not. And I think either um, asking if programs do have dedicated breast um, ultrasound techs, or if maybe potentially if they do, then does the workflow allow for you to back scan? Um, hopefully with them, I learned more than I can, you know, Absolutely. say from the text um, with ultrasound specifically. And it, it often was kind of a hindrance to their workflow because they had to do their work and then redo it again with me. But um, I found that to be, I, I did ask that over and over again. And um, I found that to be a really helpful thing. And I think that's true for whatever career you pursue, you want to be proficient at ultrasound. So I thought that was helpful. Yeah, we, we mentioned this um, last week or the week before. I mean, I, you know, I learned in my fellowship just as much from the techs as, uh, as I did from, from my staff. And um, learning how to place that probe and how to scan is paramount in fellowship. And so I think that that's a really good question to ask about, um, you know, am I, do I have the ability to go in and scan every patient um, that, that I, that I read the, all these ultrasounds, because, you know, I, you know, I tend to do that as a staff, maybe not, you know, for the, some of the, but at least for palpables and, and findings on, on mammography callbacks and stuff, I, I go in and I scan and I learned that during fellowship. I learned my technique, how to do that during fellowship. So being able to practice that in fellowship and hone your skills is, is paramount. So asking that question is good. I, I think the benefits question, if, if they're not outright with that, um, I think that's fair game. That's another, you know, good question to ask. Um, I, you know, research is, you know, they should go over this stuff with you, the research stuff. Um, just life in the life in the town that you live in. Um, I, again, I'm, I'm starting to get back into the, you know, you, you got to have a personal life as well. But, you know, we've talked about, you know, programs should, after you talk to people, in the program, the, the fellowship director and a few of the staff and maybe even the current fellow, you should have a, a general idea of what a, a typical day is like as a fellow, um, what, what, what your responsibilities are as a fellow, what the volume is like. We talked about volume and, and mentioning that. Um, getting a feel, especially now with this Zoom culture, you know, you're not going to be, you get an interview in Pittsburgh, you're not going to be visiting Pittsburgh. You get an interview in Kentucky, you're not going to be visiting Kentucky. You might not have ever been to Kentucky, but you really like what they have to offer as a program. So ask them, I, I think that it's fair game to ask them, you know, what do you like to do? Um, you know, what, what's, so I, I have a wife and a kid or I'm single or I, you know, I have a dog. What is there for me to do in this town? What is me to do in this area? you know, get a feel for that as well. Yeah, I like that question too, because it helps them get to know you and what's important to you. Mm -hmm. um, one question that I really like to ask that I think gives you a lot of information about a program is when a fellow is doing well in your program, what does that look like? Does that mean that they come oh, like at 5 a.m. and they leave at 7 p.m. and they, or does it mean that they're doing the best research project or does it mean that they're, you know, getting those procedures done and if we all get out and we go home early or, it just kind of, um, for me, frames the program really well. That's a zinger. I love that question. I wish I would have heard that when I applied. I would have asked that. I love it. That's a great question. Um, you know, we didn't also talk about um, participation in education. You know, um, you know, are, do you have any opportunities to teach residents and medical students? Um, you know, even if you're not interested in education, that's really how you know that you really have developed a mastery of the topic is if you can teach somebody else, right? So um, that's nice to know. Um, it's nice to know if you have to teach clinicians, which is like in a tumor board setting. Um, tumor board which, is huge. Yeah, so you know, will you be participating in tumor board? How often um, you know, do you present by yourself or does the attending present? And just, just different um, aspects of that I think is important to know too. Yeah, absolutely. I think most programs do some type of tumor board, but kind of getting a better understanding of what that expectation would be is really helpful. Um, oh, and the last thing is also, I think we talked about this before, is um, 
the surgical localization techniques to make sure you know you find out what kind of um, techniques they use too. Um, I think I, I always think that a variety is nice. I mean, most places don't have that. For some reason, we have some surgeons that place wires and some that place seeds. And so it's nice. That our, yeah, so we just let them do order whatever they want. We will place it, um, which I sort of like a, a little bit in terms of training because, you know, we don't have to worry that a resident is going to go out and have no idea how to place a wire, which a lot of non-academic places or a, a lot of places in general um, don't do, you know, seeds at this time, I think. Um, but uh, but that's it. Anything else that you should you should be prepared to, to ask them? Well, I will say, I say getting, getting back to that localization thing, Miffa, I'm sorry, but mm -hmm. um, just real quick. I mean, I think it's good. We, we do the same thing. We have some people that like wires, some people like seeds, and I do think it's great for, for training. But um, I've seen people that aren't good at placing wires and you learn. I mean, that's that goes back to kind of the what we were talking about before. It's good to have but I don't think that that should be a real deal breaker in that, you know, if you really like a program and all they, they only place seeds there, how am I going to learn how to place a wire? Well, you know, typically the, the, uh, the, the well-seasoned radiologist, the breast imager should know how to place a wire. So maybe that, maybe you can ask the staff, have that in, in mind. Hey, can you, can I, if I bring in a chicken leg, can you teach me how to place a wire on it? Um, you know, and you you can also, if you are in a residency program and you know that your fellowship doesn't do something, like doesn't place wires and your residency does, you can make sure that you make that last month, just ask your attending, oh. hey, I need to do as many as possible, yep. you know, during my residency because I'm not going to get it in fellowship. So, you know, keep keep an eye out for what you might be missing um, in, your, in your fellowship too and try to put those two together if you're going to a different place. So... Yeah. It's also an area I think where if you know where you're going to work and you can ask them that it's really a benefit too because like you know where I'll be working they do exclusively wires and savvy scout so you know at the end of my fellowship I had the opportunity to kind of learn savvy scout a little bit but otherwise wouldn't have um, so I think that's a nice thing to know if you can. Yeah that's yeah. a great other questions I think are important to ask would be about the patient population and how many clinical sites you're going to be going to and what those sites look like. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point because you can get um, just screening and diagnostics in another place that's like a mini breast center um, versus a, a, a full on breast center and that really changes, um, you know, how you practice too. That's a good point. That's um, the, the program yeah. itself should, I mean, cause we have different sites and uh, you know, there's a little bit different flavor. There, there's similarities, but you know, one site's kind of known as like the grinder site where that's the busiest. And the other site is the quote unquote uh, train wreck site where, you know, that's, that's the one where the complicated cases go. And then the other one's more of a community. Um, and and I, I think, you know, the program should spell that out for you. If, they, if they're going to require the fellow to go all over the, the city or the town to different sites, that, that should be something that, and, and if they don't, if they, you know, that to me, that's a red flag. Yeah, I think I like to get an idea of like, um, like, uh, you know, at Emory, we have like a county, county hospital and then you have Emory and like, you have, you get multiple different clinical experiences yep. so i that's nice but some people might only just want to go to one place so that's really your personal preference i think i mean my fellowship i i was at one place and i was actually i thought that that was a downside of the job that i took was that i was going to go to four different places and it turns out i love it <laughs> it's yeah. it's a different yeah. flavor every day i get this you know i mean if, you know not not that i not that i get angry at people but you know it's like okay i I don't wear out my welcome in any of these places, you know, so I'm kind of, you know ducking and weaving in all, all the different places. You can wear the same outfit. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay. Speaking of dress, let's talk a little bit about tips for zoom interviews. Um, is it, do you just, do you wear just a suit like you, as you would possibly if you went in person, is it business, business casual? Um, I'm thinking it is rather than casual, right? Is everybody? I mean, this I is all us. As if it were the same as an in-person interview, I would wear the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, other tips? Other tips for a Zoom interview? 
I no, I'm I wearing don't. gym shorts right now. You guys. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's no, gonna be a longer interview, so you could have to say, "Excuse me, I need to go to the restroom," and then stand up. So <laughs> say, just get all dressed. Very true. Can I, I agree. I agree. No, I'm I'm just kidding. I'm wearing long. Pants. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think Jesse's point is a really good one. I would dress the same. I would, uh, you know, mentally approach it the same. And I think with a lot of different venues now being transitioned to Zoom and, you know, and just teleconferencing, whether it's a doctor's appointment or whatever, I think we have this idea that there's an, a formality that's taken away. Um, but, you know, it shouldn't be that way. It should, you know, kind of be treated. I still think. an interview. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, still have your your binder, your folder with questions, you know, if, if that is your process that you did for residency or whatever you, but I would just sort of treat it the same way. I would, you're showing up on time is just you log in, you know, 10 minutes earlier than, you know, the appointment and that sort of thing. So I think that's just kind of the best way to set you up for, for success. Any other tips? I would say definitely test your equipment before, um, or you know maybe have a contact number in case you know you lose internet connection or or whatever. Try to find a quiet place. Life happens though, so you know uh, I don't. I think that people understand if you know you have kids and they come in, um, but you know it, the best possible find um, a quiet spot that you can um, focus on on the interview. I think. Um, Trying to, I don't do such a good job at looking at the camera. Is good, is yeah, good. They teach you to look at the eyes, but if you look at the eyes, then it, you know, it's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So looking at a camera is good, um, and I think that that's that's it. Yeah, it's, it takes a little while to get used to it, but um, but but you're right. It is still the same interview process. Um, Oh, you know, one thing that I didn't mention is hopefully most programs do give um, candidates a a chance to speak with the fellows alone. I think that that's really important. I always try to make sure that um, our fellows can get, um, you know, some time alone with the candidates so they can speak freely. And I think that that's, that's something that, um, you know, hopefully every program offers. And really as a candidate, you should take advantage of just really finding out um, what it's like to be a fellow. Uh, and, and if they don't offer that, I would probably ask, you know, if you could have an email address or a contact for a current or former fellow so that you can ask questions. Because that's really, I feel like, you know, the person that can um, answer your questions probably the best. Absolutely. Yeah. They don't have any ulterior motives. They're on their way out. So <laughs> I'll tell yeah. you the truth. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, okay, is there anything else that we're missing? I feel like we covered a lot of information. It's been a, a great, a great chat today. A great talk. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's been great. In the virtual format, if there's any opportunity to practice beforehand, like even with a friend or somebody else, I think that might just be helpful in making, it would make me feel more confident um, if I had just kind of troubleshooted someone I knew um, and kind of asked them like do I do anything weird with my eyes do I you yeah. know is the lighting kind of off or if I have a weird background my dog's here you know things like that I think might be helpful just getting some objective feedback before you before you try it yeah, yeah and question. testing it yeah so I mean uh you know test your virtual background if you're going to use one I have seen some people put virtual backgrounds and some of the print is like on their shirt and it, that's distracting for sure so if you're going to use a virtual background, which is totally fine to use, make sure you test it before, I think. Do people use those virtual backgrounds? I thought that was just <laughs> what? I've seen, somebody, um, yeah, I've seen somebody put it, you know, an x-ray up. I mean, I, I'm oh. about to go through a lot because I have to interview <laughs> fellows <laughs> and residents. I'm, I, I hope I see some funny virtual backgrounds. I'm excited now. <laughs> They'll be in Hawaii. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, ah. <laughs> right, right. Um, okay. All right. Well, if um, I, I, I'm not sure we ha if we had any questions, but if anybody has any questions um, afterwards, we'll be checking the uh, SBI Facebook page and we can try to answer the questions as, as best as possible. Um, does anybody else have anything to add? 
You're a great host, Dr. Patel. And <laughs> sounds like you're a fantastic yeah, fellowship you. director. So everyone should be applying to Ohio State. And oh. actually, you, know, you need to have some shameless plugging here. Um, you know, Allegheny Health Network's a great fellowship. You get to learn from me. OSU is a great fellowship. You get to learn from me. Um, um, and uh, we got Emory. And then where's the other fellowship? Uh, UT Southwestern. UT Thumbs Southwestern. Up. There you go. Down in Dallas. Go Cowboys. Um, you know, yeah. so. You know, if, if you know we're doing this, we get we get we get the option of doing some shameless plugs. Huh? But realistically, I mean, <laughs> fellowship, find some place that you're comfortable. It's not much different than residency from that standpoint. Find a place yeah. that you're comfortable. You can become a very good breast imager at a small or a large program. You can also be a bad breast imager if you don't put in the effort at any one of those programs. So it's all on comfort level. Very very good point. Um, next week we have um, a great panel as well. Um, Dr. Meredith Byers is speaking and Matt, uh, Dr. Miller, can you, can you tell me the title again? Yeah, so it, it's Dr. Byers, um, who she's been on a bunch of these as well. We're excited to have her back and, and leading the discussion next week. Um, she is going to be talking about screening statistics and screening options and alternatives. So it should be another discussion, get, get kind of away from, you know, gearing towards the radiologists themselves and, and talking more towards the, the general public again. Um, I think it'll be a great discussion. So we're looking forward to that. Sounds good. Okay, well, thank you guys, everybody, for your time. It was a great Thank you all. You guys were great. Thank you, Dr. Patel. You were fantastic. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. We'll see you next week. Bye. Thank you.